So on this show of Be More Super, the podcast, we've got a great guest. So if you've been watching Netflix recently, um, I'm pleased to say the number one show uh, worldwide on Netflix is the wonderful Warrior Nun. Uh, and what a guest. We've got not only the creator, but the showrunner of the show, uh, Mr. Simon Barry. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. It's nice to be here. <laughs> and uh, we were just having a chat about uh, everything in uh, Vancouver because you're in Vancouver at the moment. Um, yep. How does it feel like having a show that is now number one worldwide? Strange. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit bizarre. Um, the, uh, I mean, you always hope when you're making a show like this, starting in the writing room and when you're make, filming it, that what you're doing will catch on and people will uh, will find their way into it. And so when it, uh, and I've made many shows that didn't. So right. <laughs> <laughs> when it does, when it does, it's kind of nice um, that you're, that you're being seen and heard and that the stories that you've spent a lot of time and energy working on have an audience is the big best reward you could ask for essentially. Um, we, the cast, the team that makes the show, the writers, the directors, we all work uh, incredibly hard to produce something that is going to help um, escape, let the audience escape, let the audience laugh, cry, and experience entertainment in a way that, that we all love as viewers ourselves. So when we find something that um, clicks, it's great. It's really rewarding. And you've got a great track record, um, you know, from Continuum to Bad Blood to Ghost Wars uh, and Van Helsing. Um, and, and, and what an achievement with Warrior Nun. Um, so you're credited as a creator and showrunner. So I think we're familiar with the word creator. Uh, but what does a show... In television, yeah. And, and, and in television, what does a do? Yeah. Well, as... In, uh, as you know, from the point of view of uh, this story in particular, we adapted it from a graphic novel. So Ben Dunn created the graphic novel. We adapted it into television, which is the, my job as a creator. And then as a showrunner, really uh, the showrunner job is kind of like, I guess you could say like the director on a feature film, um, on a television show, because you have multiple directors, multiple writers, and you're sort of, uh, running a factory, as it were, because you're producing multiple episodes. In our case, it was 10. Somebody needs to kind of have the overview of the whole show, not the individual episodes. Um, and although I'm also responsible for the individual episodes, I also have to answer a lot of questions to um, keep the, the show feeling like it wasn't made by a bunch of different people. In, in this case, you know, there's over 100 on the crew uh, uh, and we have half a dozen writers, we have half a dozen directors. So it's kind of almost like you're trying to keep everything uh, as if it was coming from one brain, even though it's coming from many, many brains. And that's really just me being kind of like a conductor sometimes, okay. um, making sure that all the artists um, that are there, and there's and many of them, all have all the information they need to work in sync with everyone else. So whether that's uh, getting, you know, um, written material out in a timely manner for the production team, the artists who are going to build sets and design the visual effects and, and um, find locations, or whether it's working with uh, hiring and selecting the directors and the cast and helping them um, understand the, the, the goal of the show, you know, the long view of the show in terms of what we're, what we're gaming for. So a lot of what I do once my job is done, with the other writers is really to sort of facilitate, to be honest with you, yeah. the, uh, the other directors and the cast and the team, the production team. And then into post-production, I kind of then follow through and make sure that all of those things that we did in the writer's room in the, on the set uh, are continued through post. So again, it's that continuity of vision and that continuity of, I guess you could say, um, uh, standards, taste, and uh, making sure that the story is being told uh, in a singular way, not in 10 different directions, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it's a great, it's a great job. You have to do a lot of different things. It's not exactly, uh, it's not uniquely connected to writing. It's not uniquely connect connected to directing. And it's not uniquely connected to post-production. Kind of encompasses all of those things. Um, but I love it. It's a great job. It's a hard job, but it's a very rewarding job when something like this happens. Exactly. I mean, 
what made you uh, bring Warrior Nun to the screen? Because it was a novel back in the 90s, and now, you know, it's a smash hit globally. What, what, how did you come across the, the project, the story? Well, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the graphic novel myself until a friend of mine who's a, a movie producer approached me as a writer and said, look, I have this film I'm trying to do. It's an independent, gritty um, movie called Warrior Nun. And I was immediately like, hmm, that sounds unique and interesting. And he was trying to get this film made um, in Europe. And he asked me if I would read the script and maybe give him notes and maybe help fix the script. And he, he's an old friend. So I said, yes. I don't normally say yes to a lot of people who just ask me that. So um, I, uh, I read the script and what I realized was that there was so much warrior nun mythology that was so interesting and there was so much time and energy being spent in the script, which was only a hundred pages to service that, that I went back to him and I said, you know, I don't think work as a movie because there's just, you've got 50 pounds of things and you're trying to put it in a 10 pound bag would you consider this as a TV show? And he said, yes. And I was making TV at the time, so it made sense that I would kind of choose that angle. And then um, I made uh, my production company in Vancouver, we made a deal with him to get the television rights essentially, and that way we could shop them. And Netflix was one of the first places we presented the idea uh, of Warrior Nun as a TV show. And they, I think, saw the same uh, thing that I saw, which was this intriguing title and uh, a mythology and uh, a structure that could sustain many hours of television. And so that was kind of, you know, in a weird way, the, uh, the opposite of what the movie could do, we were able to succeed in the television version. And what was the biggest challenge of bringing Warrior Nun to the screen? Or was it just, uh, you know, an easy process? No, <laughs> it's never easy. It's... Um, I think for me, this in this case particularly, we have such a uh, we have such a strong cast, and the cast really is carrying this show. I mean, we have a lot of great locations. We shot in Spain, which was wonderful. We have great visual effects and and some good and some great storytelling. But the cast in this show, uh, as a, as compared to maybe other shows, are really I think have the burden of the show success because they are so unique and so interconnected in terms of the storytelling that we really needed a great cast. And the challenge for me, I think, was making sure that we found someone like an Alba who yeah. was, uh, especially when we're, we were dealing with um, a situation where we were approaching unknowns for the most part, uh, people who weren't household names. So to find that, and I have to say, we had an amazing casting team in LA, London, and Spain that really, um, helped us scour the planet almost for the women in the show who are all, I think, um, fantastic. And it's just rare, I think, you, that you find from, you know, kind of a, 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 a big pool of, of unknown talent, so many great actors that are kind of perfect for this show, you know? Uh, so that part was, I think, the, probably the most stressful for me was knowing that that was really important to the success of the show. And then, um, you know, it's always a challenge making TV just from a time point of view of time and money. So uh, that part was, I'm used to it though. So it yeah. wasn't uh, strange, but it's always hard work. So let's talk Fun about work. the uh, table read. So yeah. this is where the, it's, it's like the first time really all the cast are probably get a chance to sit around the same table and go through the script. Uh, I presume you were there and yes. you, was, you was watching on after the, you know, the script read, what were your first thoughts about the show? <laughs> well, I mean, for me, having written the, the first episode uh, as a writer, you're, there's a part of you that just doesn't want to be embarrassed <laughs> in the room <laughs> and have it sound awful. Um, and as a producer and a showrunner, you want to make sure that all the, um, all the boxes have been checked so that you know that the cast is, is, is going to deliver what you want them to deliver. Um, so I'm always, I always have a, a tricky time with cast with, sorry, with um, table reads because it's, I always go, Oh, is this bad writing or is it just me? You know, I always think, <laughs> cause I wrote it. It's terrible. So I always wish that sometimes it was someone else's script that was being read. But um, I think that the, 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 I think to everyone's delight, it was pretty apparent from the table read 
that not only did we have a team of actors who were really good at what they did, but that everyone was getting along really well. And there was a real camaraderie out of the gate. I mean, this was the first time a lot of the actors had even met. Um, and they were going to go on this journey with us that was going to last, um, you know, four months. And everyone was from away. You know, we, we brought a cast together in Spain uh, that were not, for the most part, we did have a big Spanish contingent, but for the most part, the cast were from everywhere else. So everyone was a little bit, you know, um, eager to bond. And you hope that those that bonding goes well because we're all stuck together in this in this town, and we're we're going to be working hard. And you want that to go well, and it seemed to go very well right right away. Everyone was really uh, in the right frame of mind and seemed to get along really well, and all very talented, which made it even better. So I was very I was very happy at the table read, and the, and uh, and I think everyone else was the director, Jet Wilkinson, who directed the first two. Uh, and our executives from Netflix were also there and they, everyone seemed to feel very good about it. Now that's excellent. I mean, when you talk about the table read and the cast, obviously the cast are incredible. I mean, after the table read, um, did you decide to change anything or were you 100% happy with the result of the table read? You always make notes in the table read because things um, come out in different ways than you imagine them in your head. And I think also... Uh, one of the, well, for me, one of the best uses of a table read is to get questions from the cast about the parts that they've read. Because a lot of times you need to give them information, backstory, context that allows them to play the line in a way that they need to play it. But, but other than that, sometimes there's confusion. And as writers, we tend to have a little bit of a, uh, um, a, uh, a blinders on when it comes to what we know about the material and what the audience doesn't know. And we are always looking for that fine line of balance between um, saying too much and not saying, and keeping the, 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 the mystery alive. So I always like table reads because you get questions from people who haven't been immersed in the material and you get your first insight into how the audience actually might react because they'll have yeah. questions that make later on be audience questions. We have to decide whether those are the good kind or the bad kind, and then we can make adjustments. So I always take notes in table reads and I always make changes. I mean, there's never, never had a table read where we didn't make a, a adjustment to the script for one reason or another. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've got to say the first season uh, is very much like a chess game. You're giving us a slice of the cake at a time and you've got us all, all hooked into each character. Um, the way that you you went through the actual se season was it meant to be like that, you know, uh, you know, us wanting more and what you know the complex characters in there. Uh, did you do it on purpose to leave us wanting more because we're all excited to find out if there's going to be a second season? Um, yeah, know, there is unconfirmed reports on the internet, but we all know what the internet is like. They yeah. all speculate. Um, but was that done all on purpose? Uh, because I've got to say, season one is, is, is definitely the start of a magnificent story to come. I mean, it sets Thanks. up all the characters so nicely uh, with Lilith, which, you know, there's loads of places you, 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 you can go with that. And the relationship with Ava and Beatrice. Um, did you have to hold back on a lot of those characters in season one? with the prospect of a season two? Well, we, we always uh, start the writing process in the writing room with the understanding that we uh, are never guaranteed a season two. So you want to make sure that you tell a great story in season one, but you also want to build in success. You don't want to plan for failure. And at the beginning of the writing room of Warrior Nun, um, we knew that Netflix was keen on us building to a um, uh, an open ending in the sense that we could uh, do a cliffhanger, but there are no guarantees, obviously, that, that, that Netflix will renew the show. But having the permission to do that is nice as writers because you do feel that, okay, well, we're getting a, we're getting a bit of a nod from the network to, uh, to aim for success, to aim for continuation, which is good. So it gives us writers kind of the, the, the permission to tee up things like you've described. 
Where are these characters going to go? What's going to happen with these storylines? So to answer your first part of your question, yes, it's all designed and it's all designed um, months and months and months before we go to camera. And on Warrior Nun, we had written all of the scripts before we started shooting. So we knew the jigsaw puzzle pieces very intimately before we started casting, before we started shooting. And that's really important because you do want to say things like, for example, with Tristan, who plays Father Vincent, I needed to let him know early on what was going to happen, even though he hadn't seen all, all 10 scripts. It was very important that he understood where his journey was going to end up by episode 10 so that he understood he, he, he could play nuance and subtext in scenes that on a rewatch would look very different than the first time you watched the show. So we did that a lot in the show. And if you watch the show a second time from the point of view of knowing what happens in season one, you'll see things you didn't see the first time because you have knowledge of things that yeah. you, you have now. So that was deliberate. And we, we were very lucky that it all came off the way it did because sometimes <laughs> you try these things and they don't. Um, they don't work. And, um, but to answer the second part of your question, look, we, we all, there is no, if I knew there was a second season officially, I would be the first person to talk about it. But Netflix has not made it official and I'm sure they're going to take their time as they usually do with, with their shows and, and announce it when they feel is the right time. I still am hopeful and I still have to think about that regardless because if they do say yes, um, then I have to be ready to go. And, uh, and obviously there's no time to waste. And are you ready to go? Have you got stories lined up? <laughs> Have you got a big well, black book full? Of, there, uh... there is a big black, there is a big book full of ideas actually. And you know, what happens in it, invariably, and this has happened in every writing room I've been a part of is by the end of the first season, you have way more ideas than you can put into the season that you're writing and making. So you, you hang on to those ideas and, and there's a very robust conversation in the writing room about what if we get a season two and what do we want to, what direction do we want to go and, and how are we teeing up seasons two, three, four and beyond with these characters and where we'd like them to go if there was a hard end point, what would we like to see happen to Ava? What would we like to see happen to, to, to the other girl? So that's, that natural function of the writing room, you can't really avoid it because you, we get caught up in it too as writers, you know, we, yeah. we get caught up in the excitement of possibility, you know, and, and it helps inform what we're writing in season one to imagine what's going to happen in season two and three and beyond. Excellent. And um, so talking about location, Spain, um, what a beautiful choice. Why Spain and how easy was it to film there? Because I've lived in Spain. Um, I know what the, you know, the local councils. <laughs> lucky, are, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> and the mayors are like, I mean, did they welcome you with open arms or, or was it a bit of a struggle to get access to certain locations? Well, we knew we wanted to shoot in Europe from the beginning because it's an old, it's a story which has a lot, a thousand year history backstory. And there's no way you can really connect that to something in North America or, or um, you know, other parts of the world that don't connect to sort of the history of Christianity and the Crusades. So for me, Spain was almost always my first choice um, because I knew that it was going to be um, uh, very film friendly too, because, you know, Spain has a great reputation, uh, a very close friend of mine, one of my best friends from my childhood was uh, uh, one of the DPs on Game of Thrones, Greg Middleton, and he had filmed in Spain. So I was actually visiting Belfast and the set of Game of Thrones when I found out that Netflix had said yes to Warrior Nun. And of course, I was with all these people making Game of Thrones in the final season who all said, oh my God, you have to go to Spain, it's the best. And if you go, you have to shoot with this company that we shot with, Fresco Films. So that was sort of the way we got into working with, I think, the best production service company in Spain. And they, because they had done Game of Thrones, they had access to great locations and they had great relationships in the government. And they had a great track record of proving that Spain is a, um, film friendly and uh, and a wonderful you know shooting experience. So that was our that was our ticket into Spain and and through Fresco we got to really um, piggyback on the success of the Game of Thrones team and the good people that had been part of that. And so we were we were ac we were given access to places that um, we were just sort of riding the coattails. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
and that made things a lot easier. But Spain was very, very um, a pleasant place to shoot. I loved the people there. The, the crew were insanely good, uh, world-class artists. And um, obviously the food and the locations are out of this world. And with the novel uh, being um, ri- uh, written by Ben Dunn, was yeah. he involved in this project at all? And has he seen it? And what does he think? So, yeah. Well, early on in the writing room, we invited Ben into a video conference just to meet everyone because we were basing this on his graphic novel. We took a very big departure from what the graphic novels are. Yeah. We, we basically decided to use the universe of Warrior Nun and not necessarily use the, um, the stories from the book. So to, to honor Ben, we wanted him to be, uh, to have at least an insight into the process that we were, we were engaging in. So early on, he came into the writing room via a video chat and asked us some questions and we kind of walked him through how a television show gets made, which is something he had never been part of. And then once we had started um, filming, uh, we invited him to come to the set in Spain and see production. So he came and visited Spain and uh, in the first week of our shooting and got to meet the cast and see how a television production uh, functions. And then since then, I've been in touch with him here and there, but I know he's seen uh, all of the episodes. He's already reached out to me to tell me how much he loved the show. And, um, and I'm very happy that he has. Uh, but yeah, we didn't, we weren't going to try and reproduce what he had done in his book. Yeah. We were really trying to more uh, honor the universe of Warrior Nun with our show because some things in the book just are, we are unfilmable, I guess you could say. <laughs> and if we did get a season two, uh, because it would be madness if we didn't, because uh, I agree. it'd, be, in, it'd be, num- be number one world worldwide. And it's such an amazing show. Where would you like some of the characters to go? Can you give us any inkling or any idea of, of, of what, what you, you would be building on in the way of characters like Beatrice or, or Lilith or Ava? Well, I think the easy question is, if you look at the things we set up in season one with all of these characters, there are unanswered questions and there are uh, tracks that have been I guess you could say established for these characters and their relationships. So we would, number one, before we did anything different, we would want to honor that, you know, honor the journey that Ava's on because she's just gone up against, you know, the devil and not in so many words. Um, and she has finally assumed the mantle of her situation for the first time, kind of. So she has to deal with that. I think with Lilith, obviously you have a, uh, something has happened to her. She's transforming in a way that is a mystery to her and a mystery to the other girls. And, and it has not yet played out. So that has to play out. Um, I think with uh, Mary, we want to know what, what happened to her, you know, because she got piled on by essentially these, uh, these, uh, these possessed uh, people in the Vatican and um, Beatrice and uh, Ava's relationship, I think there's a hint of obviously a, a very, very strong bond there that we definitely want to play out and continue exploring. And Camilla, who has now gone from eager, you know, novice to, um, to a kick-ass warrior nun, uh, she needs to keep her journey going. And, uh, and then as far as obviously Father Vincent, his betrayal, um, the yeah. relationship to the girls, um, Mother Superior, and what she's discovered and how that's going to impact her relationship with the OCS. And of course, Cardinal, now Pope Duretti, who, <laughs> who wields power in a way for the first time that no one really could expect. So I think, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tracks there that we will follow through with, but we also want to bring in, bring in some new, some new stories as well, if we get the chance. So it's a bit of both, I think. <laughs> so we've got it all, hold our breath for season two um with all the girls though i've got to say it's quite a young cast did they all behave were they very well behaved i'm thinking spain (laughs) they were really uh you know well i think when you're when you go when you go to when you're young and you go to a foreign country you can also not be super comfortable as well it can be a little bit frightening you know it can be a little bit intimidating uh, of course, everyone behaved perfectly. They were they were great. They're all they all got along great. And I think the reason they 
were so easy to deal with is because everyone kind of became friends and enjoyed this process. And being in Spain added to that. There was really, um, you know, the spirit of the country is infectious. And so you, you, you get to enjoy it. I mean, I know your Spanish experience is probably like a lot of Brits who are escaping for a holiday and go mad. <laughs> um, but we were there for six months. You know, I was there for six months. The cast was there for four months. So it was much more like living, not like you were there on a, a spur of the moment holiday. It was a little bit more like not, normal life in the sense yeah. that you had a routine, you had to go to work every day. And, uh, you know, you, of course, we had a lot of fun as well, but it yeah. wasn't, um, we weren't trying to pack a lot into a short amount of time. We were, we were there for the long haul, so we enjoyed it. <laughs> and what's your proudest moment looking back to all 10 episodes? Can you pick out <laughs> one bit that you're so proud that's really, it's, it's, it's worked perfectly? Well, I got, I got to direct the last two episodes. Yeah. And in that last two, we had this big flashback to the Crusades and a big battle sequence um, with horses and knights and crusaders and an, a, a huge... Uh, it was a huge uh, uh, responsibility to pull that off. And so I, I'm happy that that turned out well, because that would have been a big, uh, a big scandal <laughs> if I had <laughs> driven that scene into the ground and come out with something um, uh, watchable. So I'm very happy that, that, that the challenges we set ourselves all through the show, not just that sequence, but we did, we did have scenes that we looked at each other as producers and said, are we crazy? Are we going to try this? And we sort of all nodded and said, yes, let's do it. And the whole team, uh, the Spanish team and, and uh, my fellow Canadian producers, Zach and Steve, we really, uh, we really kind of uh, enjoyed the challenge, even though it was a bit scary. And, and we're very happy that we pulled it off because, uh, you know, ultimately that's what it's all about. We work for the audience. And if the audience is happy, then we're happy. Do you know what? More than happy. The show was amazing. That moment that you're talking about, the flashback scene, um, talk, talking about the ball dropping, it took a few moments me, for, for, for me to connect all the dots in my head and think, wow. And the last two episodes, absolutely perfection, I've got to say. And I interviewed Alba um, just under a week ago. And for someone that's, that's fairly unknown in the way of globally, obviously she's got a big career in Portugal uh, in film and TV, you know, you're now responsible for making a, such a global hit. Um, how, how, <laughs> how does that uh, feel? Because I know that she had nothing but good words to say about you because you gave her advice um, about being a leader and obviously yeah. enjoying it. Well, you know, she's, it's a very unique position to be the, the lead of a show regardless. And it's a very important role to play on a set. Um, and for someone as professional and as dedicated as Alba, I think she took to it like um, a fish to water. She was so engaged and so uh, keen to be that leader and be um, uh, responsible for herself and for her performance and for the, the kind of, I guess you could say, the spirit of the show that um, she, it was a natural fit. So, and she's so talented. I mean, she's probably one of those you know, this might be the um, the moment in her career where her talent when we were making the show was, as you said, unrecognized by the rest of the world, but now everyone's going to know. So it's a very, it's kind of a moment in time where you get to be anonymous and then it's all over. She's, she's uh, deserves every um, kudo that's sent her way. She's just a pleasure to work with, can act as well as anyone I've ever worked with and is a pleasure to work with as a professional and as a human being. So yeah, I can't say enough good things about her. I mean, she's she made the show, I think, uh, as special as it is. So, very, and, be very and before we wrap up the in, this lovely interview, uh, what's next for you? Because obviously, I know you're. You know, we're all holding out for season two. I keep on hinting it yeah. because I want everyone yeah. to start a trend. Hashtag season two warrior. On, let's get everyone behind it. But what's next for you, work wise? Well, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm basically hoping that's the, uh, the next, uh, the next step and I'm waiting for, to get the good word. Um, hopefully it comes soon. Uh, in the meantime, as a writer and as a director, I'm always kind of, um, developing ideas, working on other things. I have a production company in Vancouver. We work with many writers and we have many shows out in the world right now. Uh, we have a show in development with 
um, awesomeness, and we have a show in development at the at the National Broadcaster in Canada here. So we're, as a producer, I'm trying to always stay busy with uh, supporting other writers and their shows. And as a showrunner creator, I'm always coming up with new ideas that hopefully I can get out into the marketplace. This will obviously all be determined by Warrior Nun season two. If if it happens, I'll be you know digging down into that and if it doesn't happen then i'll have uh, a new show right around the corner waiting and to go. and i know that you probably can't say if there's a season two but if you could just itch your ear if there is going to be <laughs> well i want there to be but I, there's no reason for me to tell you uh, there isn't if there is i mean honestly i haven't been told so um i would i will be Shouting it from the rooftops. When okay, I get okay, told. okay. We'll, yeah. we'll, we will keep our ears to the ground and let's hope for season two. Simon, Thanks. thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with me today. All the best. Stay safe and healthy and uh, fingers crossed for season two. All right. Thanks,